for theological education, one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century is how to prepare and equip leaders fast enough for the growth that is taking place in the church in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Wesley has felt that one of our most important missions is to partner with efforts to educate leaders around the world because educating leaders is our business. That's what we might be able to contribute something in. How then can we assist partners in the World Church to develop educational programs and institutions that will serve their long-term needs? Wesley now has a vice president for global initiatives, Dr. Hyung Lim Shen Li, and she is tirelessly traveling the globe brokering these partnerships. Our goal is not to have global extension campuses of Wesley like some large universities can afford to do. Our goal is to support, assist, provide scarce resources, often faculty, for ongoing enterprises of theological education in places struggling to establish themselves and meet the challenge of providing needed leadership in that place. Wesley has been involved in three joint doctor of ministry programs with the seminaries of Europe in providing new leadership with advanced training to extend the life of the church and its ministries to the growing churches in Eastern Europe and the territories of the former Soviet Union. Nine Wesley faculty have directly taught in the seminary in Moscow, helping bridge the gap while indigenous leaders complete the doctoral work to fully staff their own programs. We are beginning our fourth Doctor of Ministry program in partnership with Methodist Theological University in Seoul, South Korea. And these programs are giving advanced preparation to leaders in the Korean churches and their missions worldwide, but also have opened those programs to educate promising leaders in Southeast Asia, many of whom already have responsibility for building theological training and leadership programs in their own countries, but are seeking additional training for that enterprise. Uh, the fourth of those uh, tracks with Asian leaders is beginning this January. Um, I, I might say parenthetically that I've taught in all seven of these Doctor of Ministry tracks and it's one of the richest experiences of my life. We don't teach them all here. Uh, we usually bring each track for one session to Wesley and we meet all of the other sessions in country in their locales, uh, which has been a very rich experience. Wesley has also supported and sent faculty to teach in a pioneering program in the Yucatan that has produced the first ordained Mayan pastors in the Mexico Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. We have an ongoing relationship with Africa University in Zimbabwe where Bishop Matthew served as Episcopal leader for a time, and Bishop Felton May has been deeply involved. This has included bringing promising students every year to Wesley for a semester of study, as well as sending faculty and students uh, to uh, teach and study in the Zimbabwe program and receiving faculty back in our own program from the faculty at Africa University. In February of this coming year, just this February just ahead of us, uh, I will be one of two Wesley faculty members teaching in the seminary in Liberia and consulting on how Wesley might partner to strengthen that program and in a place where the church is expanding far faster than they can provide leaders. These are just a few examples for one seminary. Other seminaries are likewise extending themselves in partnership to strengthen theological education around the world. But unfortunately, these are still a decided minority. That's why this is the direction we need to go in the 21st century, not something that's already been accomplished. In fact, in the context of the current economic crisis, some schools have responded by becoming more insular and self-protective. And this is a tragic miscalculation. There is not a chance that we will escape the need to increasingly rethink and act globally in the discharge of our mission. This simply must happen 
And it must happen not only for theological schools, it must happen in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries, in our communities, and in our nation. If there was ever a time for leadership and thinking globally, this is it. We desperately need the ability to think more globally. And the church has to lead. Too many theological schools are still educating leaders to serve in a church that will not meet the needs of persons living in the 21st century, but instead will meet the immediate personnel needs of a local denominational reality. A third point, theological education in the 21st century must be unreservedly committed to the church but must be open in respect to the reality of an interfaith world. In many ways, this assertion is an extension of the previous point on the globalization of theological education, but it deserves separate treatment. Since not all of the world is Christian, increased, increased global awareness and contact will bring us into interfaith contexts. But even domestically, the U.S. has a large and growing population of adherents to other religious traditions. I predict that the next census, which will get underway this March, is going to stagger us with the numbers on this. Theological education has a very poor track record of preparing pastors to understand and meet this interfaith world. In the context of global tensions, this becomes even more imperative. Bishop James K. Matthews has for many years been one of the most important voices in urging the church to give attention to interfaith conversations, a commitment nourished undoubtedly by his experience in the interfaith climate of India, but by no means limited to that context. Joseph Matthews intentionally shaped the global outreach of his own movement in terms of meeting of cultures and not just in terms of the extension of the church or of the Christian faith. And that's a significant dimension of his work. I wish I could be more encouraging at the direction of theological education in these matters, but I think many schools still regard interfaith understanding and conversation as an enriching extra, but not of central importance. Wesley, uh, took a first step in this direction with the hiring of Dr. Sathyanathan Clark to our faculty as professor of theology, culture, and mission, and now the holder of the Bishop Sundo Kim Chair in World Christianity. Coming out of the Church of South India, uh, his is one of the most important voices helping the church relate to an interfaith world, and his presence is transforming the Wesley community. He, he, I'll just say parenthetically, he's on sabbatical this year, and I, I've seen the outline of the book he's writing. It's the book we've been waiting for in this area, so watch for it. We, his name, we, we call him Sothi, he's Sothi Clark, and it's a Clark with an E on the end. <coughs> we have added courses in interfaith theological perspectives. Um, and in particular religious traditions to the curriculum. And only two years ago, the faculty added a course requirement in this area to the requirements for the Master of Divinity degree, so that every student must take at least one course in this area. We have Muslim and Jewish faculty teaching adjunct courses at Wesley uh, at the current time, and have in the past have uh, adjunct courses taught by those from the uh, Eastern and Asian religions, and we'll do so again. But currently we have Muslim and Jewish faculty teaching, including a current visiting faculty member from Turkey. Some of our cross-cultural options for students now intentionally include interfaith dimensions and experiences, and that will be increasingly so. But even these things are just a beginning, and many schools have not even made this much of a beginning. I, I think Wesley has only made baby steps in this area, but many have made no steps. The need for leadership equipped to understand and relate to an interfaith world will only grow as the 21st century progresses. And fourth and finally, 
and more briefly. Theological education in the 21st century must be committed to explore new forms of pedagogy, new structures of curriculum, new technologies, and new ways of envisioning the church. We've got to embrace the new. That's the summary of that point. Theological schools are not only places for learning and research by insightful faculty, they have to be places of effective teaching and innovative centers for visioning and learning. Both Joe and James Matthews were teachers, whatever else they were. They boldly and effectively cast the age-old gospel message into new and effective forms. Both of them were capable of being absolutely surprising in what they chose as a teaching method in a given <coughs> session. And I see you nodding heads on that. The RS and the CS curricula were rich and innovative additions to the educational landscape of the church. The design of an RS1 in its time using papers and artworks and films and innovative course designs and, yes, songs. <laughs> innovative songs. Uh, those were ahead of their time. Now, I have to say here, for some, the jury may still be out on charting as an educational technique. <laughs> but, but, but it was a pedagogical tool that engaged many laypersons in serious theological conversation for the first time that had no previous skill or practice in analyzing theological arguments. And it did it. And now they were charting Tillich. Imagine that. Bishop Matthews became my bishop here in Washington, and I know that the first year was not out before he had the entire clergy membership of the conference engaged in producing an educational resource that was then shared and used by the laity in the entire annual conference based on the confessions of St. Augustine. You remember that law? <laughs> He was a teaching bishop par excellence. In fact, he was the only person I ever knew who could use the invitation to give the benediction for a teaching moment. <laughs> <laughs> the theological school adequate to the 21st century will have to be a place that recognizes the huge changes taking place in the way people learn the methods and the technologies now available and the way these things are changing not only our culture but the church. We can't be among those who say, oh, do we have to have a screen in our sanctuary? That's exactly why some of your young adults are going somewhere else. They look at the world through several screens that they own. Worship services are now routinely incorporating media components into the worship experience. Students come to seminaries with previous university experience in online education in the use of course software to enhance the classroom experience. They can go directly to the internet from the classroom. And they know curricula that incorporate opportunities for a variety of learning styles. So the seminary can't be a place where they step back into the last century. And in a lot of seminaries, they do just that. Six seminaries are behind the universities in these areas, but many are making strides in closing the gap. And it's important to note that these have developed at such a rapid pace that not all new pedagogies or learning technology are used with the same quality of care so don't tell me how awful some online course was that you know about. There's junk out there. But you know, there's plenty of real crap in bookstores. <laughs> the job of a theological school is to help people sort that all out and know the good from the bad and learn to use it. Online education can be extremely effective for the right courses. <clears throat> we cannot innovate just for the sake of innovation. 
We have to embrace new practices while claiming them to serve the core vision and values and mission of the institution. And that will be the key. I was in a large room under the chapel in the other building in 1988 when the faculty of this seminary all opened the boxes of our first office computers together in the same room in order to receive beginning instruction in the MS-DOS operating system. <laughs> None of those computers even had color screens. Now classrooms routinely have computer and media equipment that could not even have been dreamed of at the start of my teaching career. The growth of the Henry Luce III Center for the Arts and Religion here at Wesley has created an awareness of artistic resources for learning beyond the printed page. Efforts have been made to help faculty develop pedagogies that are effective and practical in the use of these capabilities. Non-traditional ways of structuring curriculum and schedule are now commonplace. You know, you don't, you don't meet the needs of the 21st century by saying, yes, if you come here, you have to go uh, to this three credit class uh, one hour on Monday, one hour on Wednesday, and one hour on Friday, and it's always at this time, and uh, can't do that? Tough. Uh, this curriculum was made for unmarried white males who have nothing else to do, and we're sorry. You don't do that. <laughs> here, here at Wesley, we now offer courses in the daytime and in the evening, on Saturday and intensive January terms. We're offering a number of online courses in areas we believe are adapted to this method of learning. We have hybrid courses that do some part of the work online and some face-to-face. -face. We have unique videoed resources in United Methodist History, Doctrine, and Evangelism where we tape lectures from over 50 scholars worldwide giving lectures at Christ Church Oxford, Wesley's own college. Our faculty have been sent to pedagogy workshops sponsored by the Wabash Center, uh, a preeminent center for educational method. We received an invitation to participate in a three-year project called the Lexington Seminar to improve faculty teaching. We're not going to let faculty for the seminary of the 21st century think that their only goal is to do research and write books and occasionally they have to show up in a classroom. We think teaching is task number one. And we also believe the research will flow out of that. We're proud, by the way, that with this commitment to the church and this commitment to teaching on the quality control points for the United Methodist Seminaries that are collected every year, we have been the most published faculty of the 13 United Methodist faculties. We don't think you need to sacrifice scholarship in order to be about those tasks. This is all important because the church and world into which religious leaders are sent is changing in these same ways. The Matthews urged us by their own example to stay ahead of the curve in educational practice. Out there between the no longer and the not yet. And the successful theological school in the 21st century cannot be an aloof scholarly center to which students repair for a time before returning to the real world. Of course, more could be said, but time will not allow it. Theological education in the 21st century, in a word, must be responsive to the realities of the 21st century. Those laboring in theological education could do no better than to reflect in their own times and places and styles the innovative and forward-looking practices of Joseph and James Matthews in their lifetimes. Thank you.